Good morning and welcome to the Wednesday morning Mana podcast. So glad you're here with us this morning. Let's start off in prayer and say, Lord God, thank you so much for your faithfulness, God, that even though we walk away, Lord, we do so many things that are just so contrary to the plan that you have for us. Your love for us is steadfast and unfailing, even to the point that you let us, you let us hit our bottom. And yet, Lord, your word says that he who began a good work in us is faithful to complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. And Lord, I have witnessed your faithfulness in my life. I have witnessed it in so many others. And so, Lord, we pray that those that might be far away from you this morning would just turn back to you and so that lord you would pour out blessing to them in jesus name amen so last time we were together we were in the book of hosea we're working our way through the minor prophets and as we finished up last time i think i kind of rush through chapter two. So I want to back up just a little bit so we know where we're at because it really plays an important part as we look at the short chapter three this morning. But as we went through the end of chapter two, remember Gomer, Hosea's unfaithful wife, a picture of Israel, keeps going out, if you will, on God, keeps cheating on on God. It's an adulterous relationship is, is how it's described. And God, however, was still faithful to her. He kept meeting her needs with, with all of these things, although she always didn't give the credit to God. She gave the credit to her lovers. And because she was unresponsive, to the blessings of God, God's second move was, I'm going to remove all of those blessings from you. And so it became very hard for Gomer. He says in verse 11, I'm going to cause her her mirth or her happiness or the partying, all of the good times to, to end. I'm going to take away her feast days, her new moons, her Sabbaths, her appointed feasts. I'm, I'm going to destroy her vines or fig trees and and she said but because she said those are the wages that my lovers have given to me she see she gave no credit to god but god says i'm going to make them a force and the beasts of the field are going to devour them they're going to they're going to eat them i'm going to punish the feast days of the bales to which she kept giving offerings to she decked herself out in her earrings and her jewelries and she went after her lovers but she forgot god that's what the lord says now god in his mercy decides to have mercy on Gomer, but it's not the mercy that we think of when we think of mercy because there comes a point when God, where he's going to continue to pour out his his blessing, but if he continues to do that and we continue to give credit to foreign gods like Gomer was doing, it's going to make matters worse. It's going to keep enabling us to sin because we think everything's okay. Well, he's not going to do that with Gomer. In his love and his mercy, and even in his long suffering, his patience is going to be over. And God says, I'm going to I'm gonna move to this phase two, if you will. I'm going to remove the blessings. Why? So that in your misery, you're going to think back to how good you had it when you followed the Lord. Remember from where you've fallen. Remember Jesus wrote to the church at Ephesus in the, in the book of Revelations, repent. Do your first works again. That's what we can take away from this. You remember the story of the prodigal son. Dad, I want to go. I want to I want my inheritance now. I'm gonna go, you know, live it up, party, do all of these things. But eventually it got so bad he was eating the pods out of the pig's trough, and he goes, I gotta go back to my dad. Even being a slave in my dad's house is better than than where I'm at now. And so the Lord says, I'm going to rise up and, and I'm going to go back. I want you to come back. So verse 14, it's a final therefore. And remember, therefore, we always look back why it's therefore. But this therefore is a segue into a prediction. But this one is the most unusual and the greatest blessing of all. He says, therefore, behold, I'm going to allure her. 
I'm, I'm, I'm going to bring her into the wilderness. I'm going to speak comfort to her. So after exposing her shame, God is now saying that, that he's, they're going to turn, when blessing is withheld, you're going to turn back to me. I'm going to speak peace and grace and mercy and comfort you. I'm going to be the one to provide for you. I'm going to make the Valley of Acor as a door of hope. So in her misery, she, God is still calling her, come back to me. And when she's in that wilderness, we think, you know, the hammer's going to fall and God's forsaken me and all of those things. No, God is calling us in our, in our bottom, if you will, to just turn back to him. And I read that and I think of Romans 5 where it says, where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. See, when sin reaches its high water mark, grace overflows. You can't erect a dam so tall and so massive that God's grace can't overflow it. But you go, you know, John, you don't know. You don't know all of the things that I've done. You don't know where I've been. I don't need to know. God knows all of those things, and yet God is willing to extend mercy from whatever valley of Acor you're in, whatever wilderness you're in. He, he is your door of hope, and it could be a whole new relationship with him if you allow him back into your life. And the Lord tells Gomer, in that day you're going to call me your husband. No more of this, this worshiping other gods. No more getting your gifts from other lovers. See, what was happening is they referred God to God in the same category as all of the other gods, all of the other Baals that they served, the Ashtaroths, all of those other idols. They referred to them as the same way, in the same way that they referred to God. Now, there was the sin of Israel. It's not that they completely rejected God or had nothing to do with him. They just put him on the same level as all of the other gods. But God is an only and a unique. He's not among the others. Our God, your God, the Lord Jesus Christ, is one of the many roads to truth, is what the world will tell you. And that's what Israel was doing. They reduced God to to just one of the others, but God wants that husband relationship, that intimate relationship with the nation of Israel, and God promises that they will be restored. He says, I'm going to make a covenant for them with the beasts of the fields, with the birds of the air, with the creeping things of the ground, bow and sword of battle I will shatter from the earth and make them lie down safely. And then we get into verse 3, chapter one, or chapter 3, verse 1. It says, Go again and love a woman who is loved by her lover and committing adultery. See, it's like the love of the, of the Lord for the children of Israel who looked to all these other gods, loved the raisin cakes, it says, of the, of the pagans, the sacrificial cakes that, that they would make for the false gods of the Canaanites that they use. And it says... Hosea is speaking, I bought her for myself. So here's the picture. He's down at the slave market because he's buying his own wife back that she, that he has a covenant with. But because of her sin, she's now all the way to her bottom. She's, she's in the slave market and he buys her back. That's redemption. He buys her back for 15 shekels of silver, one and a half homers of barley. That's a typical price, the going rate for, for a female slave and he says to her I, I will you will stay with me many days you will not play the harlot nor shall you go out and have a man so too I will be towards you sometimes a person will say you know I know that I'm at my bottom but I'm going to make myself better I'm going to do all of this on my own. I'm going to make the changes. My life isn't everything that it should be before God so I'm going to change it but we're not the ones that can change ourselves. God does the changing. 
It's when we repent of our sins, when we realize that we are in abject poverty, as Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the poor in spirit. Spirit, And that's where we need to find ourselves, poor in spirit, that we need nothing but God. That's the first step in coming to God is to realize that, that you're a sinner. You're bankrupt before God. You have nothing in and of yourself that merits anything from God. God owes us nothing, but God will save us in his mercy and in his grace. And that's the condition of a slave is we're poor in spirit. But then he says... The children of Israel shall abide many days without a king or a prince, without sacrifice or sacred pillar, without ephod or, ephod or teraphim. Afterward, the children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God and David their king, that is, the dynasty of David, the greater son of David, the Lord Jesus Christ, and they shall fear the Lord and his goodness in his latter days. So this is one of those great prophetic announcements announcements in all of scripture because it says many days now god usually is very precise in what he says god told abraham remember you and your descendants are going to be in a foreign land 430 years that was egypt and then they came back after 430 years god was very precise with with jeremiah he says the children of judah will be in captivity in babylon for 70 years remember that's what daniel based all of his prophecies on and God did bring them back. But here it's kind of this nebulous thing. Many days. There will be many days without a king. Now we know that every time they were out of the land, God predicted and God predicted they would come back. We know that they're back in the land today, that they've returned. But it also says there will be many days without a king, without a prince. Since the days of King Zedekiah in Judah, there has been no king reigning on the throne of David. There's a kingless throne over in Jerusalem. It's never been set on since that time. Now they've returned to the land today, but nobody is sitting on that throne. So Israel, according to this, would be without sacrifice. And they've been without sacrifice in their temple since 70 AD. They've returned, but there's no priest. There's no ephod. There's no teraphim. There's no idolatry, but there's also no king. They're looking for that Messiah who will unify the north and the south together. Look at it this way, and we'll close this morning. In Jerusalem today, there is a kingless throne. In heaven today, there is a throneless king. When the throneless king meets the kingless throne, that will be glory. That's when Jesus will come back. Everything will be united. The law will go forth from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And Jesus will rule and reign as that head from Jerusalem in the millennial reign of Christ. And we so look forward to that day when Jesus comes back to, to put an end to all of this trial and tribulation on the earth. So let's pray and say, Lord, thank you, God, that we have your hope and your promises, Lord, that you are faithful to us when we are even at our worst, Lord. But we look to the nation of Israel, Lord, and we know that you are not going to abandon your people, that you are coming back not only for them, Lord, but you came for us. You saved us on the cross of Calvary, and our hope is secure in heaven. So let us, Lord, even in when we find ourselves in those desperate times, of sin and struggle and even failure, Lord, that we quickly turn to you in, in, in our poverty and say, Lord, save me. And we know, God, you are faithful and true, and you will. So we just praise you for that this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.